According to the adherence survey, which is taken from census and uh, taxes and government figures of all kinds, there are 4,300 religions in the world, and nearly 75% of the world's population practices one of the five most influential religions, which are Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism. Now, the six largest religions in the world are Christianity with 2.1 billion followers, Islam with 1.3 billion folks, those who are atheists, agnostics, or secularists, they're growing. If you group them together, they number 1.1 billion people in the world. Hinduism has 900 million. Chinese traditional religion has 394 million people. Buddhism has 376 million followers. And then let me just add a few others here that you're familiar with. Judaism has 14 million followers. The Baha'i have 7 million. Jainism has 4.2 million, Shintoism has 4 million, and Zoroastrianism has 2.6 million followers. Now, I gave you all that information, and it's been up on the screen. So looking at these figures, one wonders, how in the world can you harmonize all of those religions with different doctrines? And in 1993, Irwin, you went to the Parliament of World Religions, and uh, it was not too far from Moody Church, and so you went over there. And I want to know, why did you go, and what did you learn about what was happening? First of all, I want to say what a privilege it is to discuss this idea and the whole message of Jesus. And I want to say a personal word to those of you who have joined us today. I hope that no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, that you listen very carefully. Perhaps you belong to one of these religions, or maybe you don't belong to any religion. No matter where you are, I want you to listen, because the purpose of this series is to help all of us to understand why Jesus cannot be combined with all the other religious leaders. He is special, He is unique, and he's the only one qualified to actually save us. So John, first of all, let me say that Jesus was admired at the Parliament of World Religions. Wonderful things were said about him, but it was generally believed that he's for the Westerners, whereas other religions are for the East and so forth. So he was seen as a great teacher. He was seen as a great moral leader. And that's why many people admire Jesus. But the reason that many people admire him is because they don't really understand who he is. Right. The closer they get to who Jesus is, the less likely they will actually admire him. They may even turn away from him. Why? Because he is absolutely special. Now, John, you mentioned in your intro that Jesus is a sinless Savior. Yes. When I was at the Parliament, I went into the lower level of the hotel, and I want to describe it. It had perhaps a hundred or a hundred and fifty different tables with all of the literature that belongs to various religions. And so I went on a search for a sinless Savior. And the reason I did that is because I'm a sinner, and I know that uh, if I'm to be saved, I have to be saved by someone who is not a part of my predicament. For example, if you're drowning in a lake, you can't be helped by someone who also is drowning. You need someone who is able to uh, take those waves and to be able to master them because they are not part of where you are at, but above your need. Now, here's what I did. I went to the lower level with all of these tables, and I went on a search for a sinless Savior. I remember with such clarity that the first table I stopped at was someone who represented the Hindu faith. So I said to the person, I said, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. And uh, does Hinduism have a Savior who is sinless? He said, no, no. You know, if anybody claims sinlessness, he is not a Hindu. 
we don't have a sinless savior or even a sinless prophet. Then I went to the Buddhist. No, Buddha claimed enlightenment, but not sinlessness, I was told. And then from there, of course, I went to the followers of Islam, and they said, no, Muhammad did not claim sinlessness, nor did he claim to be a savior. As a matter of fact, in the Quran, he actually said that he himself needed forgiveness. Now, here's the point, and this is so critical for everyone who is listening. In Jesus, we have someone who was sinless, and because of his sinlessness, he's qualified to save us from our sins. The great human need is not for us to have prophets and gurus who tell us, you know, take this path or live this way. What we need is someone who is actually able to forgive our sins, introduce us to God, and declare us to be as righteous as God himself is. That is the good news of the gospel, and only Jesus meets that qualification.